Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Et je salue ceux qui nous suivent, ceux qui nous suivent à distance, tous les internautes très nombreux qui, au-delà de cette assistance, suivent ce cycle de conférences. Je me permettrai juste de faire un, un petit rappel. Euh, vous savez que justement nous avons cette captation, nous avons la traduction simultanée, donc euh, je vous demanderai de ne pas faire euh, de... Please don't be... Don't make any noise, please be careful, especially at the end of the lecture. For those of you who need to leave in a hurry, if you need to leave, don't make any noise because that will disrupt the uh, web stream in particular. I wanted to say that because it was kind of noisy last time. I'm really delighted, really delighted to welcome Meran Kamrava to this series of lecture, lectures. You uh, know him. I'll uh, introduce him succinctly after studying in the US, especially at the University of California, then a brilliant thesis at Cambridge University in the UK. He became a, a PhD in philosophy. It's true that in our area of international relations and political science, in particular matters of strategy and defense, there were some migrations of philosophers. It's a big tradition in France with Pierre Asner and Raymond Aron, who came here before he passed away. He came to one of our rounds of lectures. It's a big tradition. And it's also part of the genes of uh, this uh, chair, uh, which is uh, in the uh, units in the departments of uh, law and philosophy and uh, international relations and students can come from any of those disciplines. He started lecturing at the University of Georgetown in Qatar and since 2015 he's been leading the international Center for uh, the Center for International and Regional Studies, especially Iranian studies. He's, of course, a great specialist of Iranian matters and the Persian Gulf at large. And so we could find no better person than him to give this lecture devoted to the emergence of this region, the Persian Gulf, and the new balance of power in the Middle East and all the problems that are concentrated in this region. He authored many articles. You can find them easily. They are quoted in his bibliography on his website and the website of Georgetown University in Qatar. He's preparing one book. I don't know whether it's been published yet. Uh, I was farm rules how Islam rules in Iran. I don't know whether it's published yet, but... And before that, at Cambridge University, many, many books devoted either to the Persian Gulf issues or Iranian issues and more broadly to matters of military organization and security in the region. Of course, he's going to talk about it tonight. It's a region that for decades has been marked by the repetition of conflicts in this area, marked by issues of political instability, instability and political difficulties and challenges and confrontation between religious communities also marked by intrusions, interference, and military operations from the West. All that overlaps and culminates in the difficulty of achieving both peace and stability in the region that also has many potential sponsors or hegemons. So we talked about Iran, we could talk about Saudi Arabia or other countries aiming in particular, well, maybe not for such a position, but uh, at least trying for no one else to acquire a hegemonic position in the region. So you know the rules, I'll remind you very quickly. You have as long as you want for your lecture, 45, 40 minutes as you wish, and then we'll have a quick discussion together, and then we'll take question from the audience, uh, always first questions from the students, and then also opening it up to um, members of the public. Dear Meron, dear Professor, thank you so much for coming all the way here, and you have the floor now. 
sincere thanks for that uh, warm introduction. It is a pleasure and an honor being here. Um, I am most grateful to Sorbonne for this kind uh, invitation and particularly to the organizers for their brilliant uh, organization. Um, oh, absolutely, absolutely, yes. yes. <laughs> Uh, as you know, in the Middle East, we pride ourselves in hospitality, and I think uh, we have a few things to learn from the French. So uh, uh, my sincere thanks. I apologize uh, for delivering this lecture in uh, English and not in French. Uh, you would not want to hear me uh, in, uh, in French, I assure you. Uh, I say this with a little bit of reluctance. Uh, we're at a historic moment in uh, the Persian Gulf, certainly at an inflection point. And I say it with reluctance because we hear that term again and again. Uh, if we were speaking about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and probably five or 10 years from now, we would be talking about being at a historic moment, because things change so dramatically and so rapidly and so um, unpredictably in the Middle East at large, and particularly in the Persian Gulf, that um, it is all historic moments. But there are a few indications right now, particularly over the last two, three years, that have really changed things um, and are likely to have significant consequences uh, um, in the forthcoming uh, years. Um, particularly beginning in 2020, 2021. A good uh, reference point, historic reference point, would be uh, COVID. Right smack during COVID, as COVID was ravaging the region, the Middle East and uh, countries around the Persian Gulf, particularly Iran, things began to change rather dramatically. And things began to, uh, we began begin to see a number of historic and important changes. So one of the things we see is that there are some major changes occurring in the security arrangements in the Persian Gulf, but at the same time, there are a number of very important continuities. And what I want to do tonight is to very briefly share amongst ourselves some of the important factors that are changing, particularly beginning with the uh, how the region looks right now as we look at it, what are some of the important security issues that are shaping assumptions in the Persian Gulf, in regional capitals, not necessarily from the outside, by, but by the actors that are important and relevant. Those actors, of course, are first and foremost Washington, then, of course, Saudi Arabia and what's happening there. We have a very important actor often called the Little, little Sparta, uh, United Arab Emirate, the country where I have been living since 2007, Batar, of course, the regional power, Iran, is quite important. And then I will end with a couple of uh, thoughts as to what we're likely to see in the coming years. So we, uh, 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 we, uh, I should, uh, I will be as brief as possible. You said speak for as long as you want. You don't want to say that to a professor because we'll speak endlessly, but I'll, yes. I'll, I'll keep it as brief as possible. Let me just uh, set the uh, scene and kind of share with you what some of the important regional uh, factors are. First of all, if we look at the Middle East, particularly prior to October 7, one of the things we see is that there is a sense of enough conflict, particularly in regional countries like Iran, Saudi Arabia, Qatar. These are countries that 
up until October 7, 2023, are emerging out of uh, important conflicts and are kind of coming out of conflict. The United States also is trying to, in many ways, recover from the Trump era, but the United States is also deeply committed to presence, security and military presence uh, in the Persian Gulf. Now, in March of 2023, we had that major reconciliation between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And earlier in 2021, we had had reconciliation between Iran and the United Arab Emirates. This occurred right smack during uh, COVID, um, and, and uh, it was kind of part of this process of region recovering from uh, COVID, where we had these um, uh, rapprochements between Iran and Saudi Arabia and Iran and the United Arab Emirates. And one of the primary reasons for the UAE, for Saudi Arabia, for Iran, was because each of the policymakers in these countries wanted to focus on delivering on the economic promises that had brought them uh, to power. Uh, President Raisi was elected in Iran on the two promises of uh, ending COVID or mass vaccination, and then uh, stopping the Iranian currency, the rial, from sliding. Uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, became all concerned about Vision 2030. I'll mention that in a bit. And of course, the UAE is trying to develop at breakneck speed. So economic priorities became the dominant policy objective of each of the leaders in the regional countries. But this was not to say that they put aside their animosities and particularly their competition. The UAE and uh, Qatar, Qatar and Bahrain, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, all of these countries are trying to compete with one another for economic development. The pie, if you will, is finite, and they're going after a finite pie. Having said this, of course, in order to focus domestically, you would have to focus on regional de-escalation and to de-escalate uh, regional tensions as much as possible so you could focus inward and on economic development. So what are some of the overarching security issues within this context of focusing on economic development, trying to uh, reduce regional tensions. And so what are some of the security dynamics that shape uh, the security of the region? Well, we heard towards the end of the Obama administration, we heard the term Asia pivot, that the United States was changing its uh, gaze, changing the direction of its gaze towards Asia. Well, this is not to say that the U.S. decided to uh, ignore or neglect or even lessen its attention to the Middle East or to the Persian Gulf. Although the U.S. now has become a competitor in LNG exports, liquefied natural gas exports to countries like Qatar and, of course, Iran, nevertheless, the United States remains deeply committed to staying in, uh, in the region. And this uh, perseverance of the United States has created a deep sense of psychological dependence, particularly among the smaller states. If you're in Bahrain, you welcome American presence. If you're in Qatar, you welcome the American military base. You know that the Americans have the biggest air base outside of the United States, the biggest forward military base outside of the United States 
in Qatar, actually a few kilometers uh, from where I work and where I live. And that military presence is deeply welcomed and deeply dependent on, dependent on. Have it, and, and part of this reason is because of the Islamic Republic, because Iran remains a source of mistrust, because Iran is seen as some country that cannot be trusted, whether it's because of sectarian differences or because of Iran's support for non-state actors, for a whole variety variety of reasons across the Persian Gulf, in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the UAE, Bahrain, and to a lesser extent, Kuwait and Oman, there is deep mistrust uh, towards Iran. Now, one of the things we see is that there, this mistrust towards Iran uh, is not unique because Qataris don't trust the Saudis. The Saudis don't trust the Emiratis. Qatar and Bahrain don't trust each other. And this has had consequences. There is mistrust by all actors. You remember that from 2017 to 2020, we had the so-called Gulf crisis where United uh, Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain Bahrain blockaded Qatar and tried to make Qatar change its security and foreign policy somewhat uh, fundamentally, and that, of course, is, is uh, pervasive. So there's, there's continued mistrust uh, by all actors. Now, um, we hear a lot of talk about uh, whether or not China is going to become a military power in the Persian Gulf. China is free riding, uh, and China wants the United States to provide security in the waterways of the Persian Gulf so that it can engage in trade and investment and, uh, and uh, have security in the region, courtesy of the Americans, so it can easily uh, continue to um, engage in, um, in trade and investment. China is a major actor in places like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. The Gulf Cooperation Council has declined a great deal. Uh, from 2017 to 2020, the GCC was on life support because People from the, in the GCC were actually not even allowed to talk to each other. The Qatari representative and the Bahraini representatives couldn't talk to each other. Now it's no longer on life support. It has been resuscitated, but nonetheless, it is not as uh, active uh, as uh, anymore. And uh, so once you have these multilateral relations collapse, relations have become transactional. So a lot of countries engage in bilateral relations, not out of principle, but out of immediate returns. What's in it for me? What are the immediate tangible interests that I can gain from dealing with whoever is going to deal with me? Not necessarily out of some overarching principles like Gulf solidarity or Arab solidarity, but out of more immediate and tangible uh, results. And of course, this has become all the more important since October because, or since December of 2023, because as we know, the Houthis started attacking shipping lanes, not necessarily in the Persian Gulf, but in the Red Sea. And that, of course, has reverberations for the um, Arab Peninsula and the Persian Gulf because. All of the countries are involved there, and in particular, of course, Saudi Arabia shares a major, major coastline uh, in the Red Sea, and for Saudi Arabia, Houthi attacks are quite important and quite consequential. So now that is the larger context within which uh, assumptions and security threats and opportunities are being formed in uh, the Persian Gulf. Let us look at what each of the actors that are involved um, 
think about the region and how they view and how they uh, base their policies in relation uh, to the Persian Gulf. And let's first look at how things are seen from the perspective of Washington, particularly under the Biden administration. Now, let me just say that uh, in the United States, pres presidents become known for their foreign policy doctrines. And these foreign policy doctrines are articulated over the course of their presidency. They give speeches, they go before the Congress every year, and they deliver the State of the Union address. And over time, they become known for their doctrine. So we know the Nixon doctrine. It's actually the Nixon-Kissinger doctrine. We have the Carter doctrine, the Reagan doctrine, so on and so forth. Now, Biden, when he came to office, almost immediately and very deliberately, he articulated the Biden doctrine. He didn't wait for it to be articulated over time. And there's two main reasons for this. The primary reason is because he was trying to introduce a new face of the United States to the world. And therefore, immediately, in contrast to the Trump doctrine, he articulated the Biden doctrine within the first year of his presidency. And also Biden, of course, was a long-term senator. He was uh, vice president for eight years. He already knew what he wanted or where America stood. And so immediately the Biden doctrine became the guiding doctrine of the State Department. It became what the State Department uh, implemented in terms of American foreign policy. And some of the main features of the Biden doctrine so far as we have come to know them are first and foremost a more restrained use of American uh, military um, uh, uh, in order to preserve um, America's role in the world. Biden is very traditional. Biden has a sense of America's position in the world. Biden has an assumption about what America needs to do, which is quite traditional. Uh, America needs to play a leading role uh, in the world. And in order to play that leading role, every once in a while, America needs to resort to its uh, military might. It needs to be constrained. It cannot do so liberally or uh, gratuitously, but it needs to play a leading role in uh, the United States. This is because, and this is within the context of new competition that occurs. And that competition to the United States comes primarily from China. It comes in the form of China's technological competition to the United States. China is an existential competitor to America's global technological advantage. Now, interestingly, the Biden doctrine was articulated before Russia invaded Ukraine. And in the Biden doctrine, Russia was perceived as a disruptor of international order, as a power that disrupts the uh, traditional international order. And as if to prove Biden right, Putin invaded uh, uh, Ukraine. Now, of course, it's not just Russia and China that the United States needs to be uh, attentive to. Uh, North Korea is a nuclear power and uses that nuclear power, um, uh, uh, its nuclear weapons in terms of testing and in terms of threatening security in the uh, Korean Peninsula. And Iran, if, is, is, if Iran is left unchecked, has the potential of becoming a nuclear uh, proliferator. And Iran, China, and Russia pose one of the greatest threats to the stability of the American political system in terms of the cyber threats that they pose. Russia was quite active in the last presidential election, or at least was rumored to be active, 
uh, in the last presidential election, trying to influence American uh, elections. And of course, Iran is uh, not far behind, and so is uh, China. And of course, there's the ever-present threat of um, terrorism from these weak states that have proliferated across the Middle East in particular. Weak and fragile states like Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Libya, these become petri dishes for terrorism, where terrorists can, um, uh, uh, can, can engage in all sorts of terrorist activities, and the United States, therefore, needs to be quite uh, quite active. So even as you see from this very brief outline of the Biden administration, the Middle East at large and the Persian Gulf in particular play important roles and America cannot afford to take its attention away from the region. It will need to be um, attentive to other parts of the world, but it cannot necessarily be uh, unattentive to um, uh, the Persian Gulf in particular. Now, let's turn our attention to the region, beginning with uh, uh, a country that has been in the news a lot lately. And of course, um, this has been a country that has had an important leadership transition uh, beginning in uh, 20, uh, 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 2015. We had a very important transition in the sense that uh, we had a new king, King Salman, and almost soon thereafter, his son, Mohammed, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, Mohammed, son of Salman, uh, became, um, uh, eventually he became heir apparent, uh, but became prime minister and defense minister. And almost immediately, he engaged in a bunch of misadventures that quickly became quite costly. Uh, these were misadventures like the um, uh, invasion of Yemen. Yemen has been a thorn on the south of Saudi Arabia for decades. And the Saudis, or at least Mohammed bin Salman in uh, hubris, thought he could settle the Yemen problem once and for all, and Yemen became a quagmire. And then uh, there was this unsavory murder of the dissident Jamal Khashoggi, the journalist, and then there was the blockade of Qatar, and all of these became incredibly costly. And one of the things we see since 2021 is that Mohammed bin Salman seems to have grown up. He seems to have done some on-the-job training and realized that these misadventures only bring negative publicity and divert him from uh, his ultimate goal, which is to turn Saudi Arabia into a major global economic power. And so it appears that particularly since 2020, 2021, after Trump, the enabler, left, Mohammed bin Salman has taken a very different approach to international relations, to global politics, to Saudi Arabia's larger profile uh, in, uh, inside the country and, uh, and globally. And of course, he remains incredibly popular among the young. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman has, as you know, instituted a series of extremely popular measures, uh, allowing women to drive, sponsoring uh, various sporting activities, sponsoring, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, women's golf and wrestling matches and things that are uh, appeal to the young. And of course, he's become quite young. Having said this, I want to also remind us that Mohammed bin Salman dismantled the Saudi deep state. You remember that he rounded up all the princes and he put them in the Ritz-Carlton, uh, in the Riyadh Ritz-Carlton. This became known as the Night of the Long Knives. 
And what he did with that, he dismantled, he removed from their jobs all of these princes, members of the ruling family that staffed the different parts of the Saudi state. He removed them because they could be potential competitors. And of course, anyone who didn't find themselves at the Ritz-Carlton became quiet afterwards. But what that did was it changed fundamentally the nature of decision-making in Saudi Arabia, which up until that point had been consensus-based, had been had a foundation. And so now he's basically the only man standing. And as the only man standing, well, that has its advantages, but it can also have very serious disadvantages, uh, which I'll mention in a minute. For now, the only man standing with no competition, of course, is moving full steam ahead with Vision 2030. Everything that Saudi Arabia does is with an eye towards delivering Vision 2030, this very ambitious, um, uh, high-impact development that the Saudis want to do. And as a result, for the time being, that has put a hold on regional adventures. Um, now, I say for now, because do you remember Saddam Hussein? He was also the only man standing. Saddam Hussein, some of us are old enough to remember he was the darling of the French because he was secular, he was enlightened, he was going up against the Iranian uh, religious fundamentalists, and then we remember what he did after he was done with his invasion of Iran, thanks to all sorts of French weaponry and uh, jets. Then he turned around two years from that, 18 months from when he was done with Iran, he invaded Kuwait. And then of course he was the butcher of Baghdad in the meanwhile. So I remember Saddam Hussein and I remember what he did for regime survival, what uh, the depths to which he sank in order to save his hide. And you know what? I'm also reminded of the tragic history of the region. And is Mohammed bin Salman another Saddam Hussein? Let's hope not. But that is always a danger when you're in that kind of a predicament, when you're when you have um, unlimited power, when you have when you're the darling of the West, when you are willing to do anything and everything for regime survival. Let's hope that that is incorrect, but certainly that is a possibility. But also, on yeah. with Israel, you might remember that a couple of weeks ago, the Saudis, uh, the Saudi Foreign Ministry, released a statement saying we're not going to um, uh, uh, we're not going to normalize relations with Israel until there's a Palestinian state, and that seems to have uh, uh, poured cold water on the prospects of normalization. However, I think that's a matter of time. Once the war with Gaza is over, once things go back to normal, to the extent that they can be normal, I think normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel is only a matter of time. For the time being, uh, we have what uh, is, uh, what, uh, we have a statesman and Mohammed bin Salman acting as a global statesman that um, he wants uh, all of us to see. And let's hope that in fact, that remains uh, the case. Now, Mohammed bin Salman, of course, and Saudi Arabia are competing greatly with uh, the United Arab Emirates. And there is a slightly different view of regional dynamics and regional security from Abu Dhabi than there is uh, from, from Riyadh. As you know, um, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed has now, uh, since uh, for about a year, is now the uh, uh, 
the president of the UAE and uh, is uh, calling the shots. And of course, um, one of the important things that Saudi, uh, that the United Arab Emirates has tried to do uh, since the Arab Spring uprisings, he has been trying to, uh, UAE has been trying to fill the vacuum left by uh, Qatar. Once Qatar severed its ties with its proxy groups in Syria and in Libya, then the UAE stepped in and tried to fill the gap. You might remember that when Muammar Gaddafi's compound was overrun, when the Libyan revolutionaries uh, attacked Muammar Gaddafi's compound. The first flag they put up was not the flag of the uh, free Libyan, uh, uh, the, the, of the free Libyans, it was the flag of Qatar as a sign of gratitude for all the weapons that Qatar had sent. Well, uh, in 2013, you will see in a minute, Qatar had a leadership transition. It changed its foreign policy. Libya uh, disintegrated into civil war. And in places like Libya and Yemen, of course, and to a lesser extent, Syria, the UAE stepped in and tried to fill that um, a vacuum. And this is largely because of the competition that I mentioned earlier with its rivals. Now, th there's an interesting development in relation to the UAE. All of these states, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, of course, align their foreign policy with the United States. But the United Arab Emirates, for the past three, four years, has been trying to exercise what in the UAE they're quite proud of and they call it strategic autonomy. When the Americans asked the Emiratis to condemn um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, they didn't. In fact, they hosted Putin. So did the Saudis. But deliberately, the Emiratis told the Americans, we like you, we like your weapons, we support you, but we also have strategic autonomy. And we have strategic autonomy because we're a middle power. Now, those of us who study international relations know by any matrix, the United Arab Emirate is considered a small state in terms of demography, in terms of geography, in terms of its capabilities, but that's not how the UAE sees itself. It sees itself as a global middle power on par with, for example, Brazil and India that can exercise strategic autonomy and tell the Americans, you have your priorities, we have our priorities. And our priorities may not always align. And this is a very new development in Emirati foreign policy. It's only since 2020, 2021, uh, that we see this in relation uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the UAE. This strategic autonomy has not always been the case. Now, the Emiratis might exercise strategic autonomy, but the country that I live in is quite aware that it is actually a small state. And as a small state, what it wants is as few adversaries as possible and as many friends as possible. And in order to ensure that, Qatar engages in a foreign policy uh, initiative known as hedging. Hedging comes from gambling. And it is when you place one big bet one way and you place a bunch of smaller bets the opposite way. So your security bet goes with the Americans. You house the biggest American air base in Doha, and then you maintain relations with Iran, with Hamas, with the Taliban, with whoever, because you cannot afford as a small state to have 
enemies or adversaries, particularly if you share the world's biggest gas field with Iran, you cannot afford to antagonize the Iranians. And so from the mid-1990s on, Qatar has been pursuing a foreign policy of hedging whereby it has tried to be friends with everyone, more friends with some people and less friends with others, but at least appear friendly with others. And so this is an incredibly complicated foreign policy that is not without risk, because if you look at it from the outside, it looks quite incoherent. What are you doing talking with the Taliban? Why are you talking to the Iranians? Are you friendly with Hamas? What are you doing housing Hamas? One of the uh, things I've been doing for the last two weeks, three weeks, two months, I've been getting all these phone calls from reporters. Why is Qatar sponsoring Hamas? And I have to explain, Qatar is a small state. It is not in the business of sponsoring Hamas. It houses Hamas because the Americans want Hamas there. And the Americans don't do anything that antagonizes the Israelis. It's the Israelis and the Americans that want Hamas in Doha. Uh, but, of course, uh, it's difficult to grasp that, and with hedging comes a lot of reputational uh, risk. And one of the things with hedging is that when you try to maintain open lines of communications with everybody, you become strategically positioned to be a perfect middleman. You become a perfect... Uh, nexus between people who don't talk to each other. So, for example, if the Americans want to talk to the Taliban, who talks to both the Americans and the Taliban? Ah, it's Qatar. Who talks to both the Americans and the Iranians when they want to swap hostages, swap prisoners? Ah, it's Qatar. Who talks to the Americans and to Hamas? Ah, it's Qatar. So, Qatar has deliberately made mediation as a pillar of its foreign policy. Now, having said all of this, I, again, I have to say that Qatar doesn't do anything uh, without America's consent. Qatar imports vegetables. For example, if you go to Carrefour in Doha, um, you see vegetables imported from Iran. That import is with the consent of the American embassy in Qatar. They inform the Americans as to what they're doing because, of course, they don't want to jeopardize their security uh, relations. Now, um, I'm, I'm ending. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm ending. Let's now look at Tehran, how Tehran sees uh, the region, how Iran uh, sees the region. Well, you... I mentioned earlier uh, that there was uh, an election uh, in Iran in 2021 in which the current Iranian uh, president, Ebrahim Raisi, uh, was elected. This engineer, by all accounts, uh, was engineered. This election was engineered um, in, in a way to um, produce a particular result. Every other candidate who was possibly electable was eliminated by the vetting process of the Guardian Council. And Iran, the hybrid authoritarian state, became now a fully authoritarian state. Uh, elections actually have historically meant something in Iran. And every once in a while, they produce surprises. In 1997, they produced a surprise. In 2013 and 2017, they produced a surprise. And the powers that be, the deep state in Iran, if you will, didn't want any surprises in 2021 because the assumption is that the 84-year-old supreme leader might pass away during the tenure uh, of the current president in office. So you want to make sure that there is... Uh, that everything is set for a possible leadership transition and that there is no factional 
um, uh, disunity within the political system so that everyone occupying different positions of power in Iran, the parliament, the president, the revolutionary guards, the bureaucracy, everybody is on the same page. And so there is tremendous factional uniformity within the political system. And this is why Ebrahim Raisi's election was, um, uh, was engineered and he came uh, to office. So for the first time since the 1980s in Iran, there is no factionalism in the Iranian state. We don't have reformists and principalists and conservatives. Everybody is now conservative. Everyone who is in power, everyone who is in office now sees the world as the supreme leader does. Ali Khamenei. And how does the supreme leader and therefore the president see the world? Well, you know what? The Iranians say in 2015, we signed a, a nuclear accord uh, with the European Union and the Americans and China and Russia. And in 2018, the Americans withdrew and the EU didn't have the backbone to stand, to the, stand up to the Americans. So because of the betrayal, we're going to look east. And so one of the official doctrines of Iranian foreign policy is now the look east policy. This doctrine has been in practice for more than a decade, but Raisi has made it a formal doctrine of Iranian foreign policy. Complementing this is good neighborly relations, ensuring that Iran and its neighbors are in on good terms, and that Iran and its neighbors uh, have tension reduction. Now, interestingly, you might remember that the former administration of Rouhani tried to reduce tensions with Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, when it uh, proposed the so-called HOPE initiative, H-O-P-E, which stood for Hormoz, peace endeavor, and there were no takers. But then, of course, after 2020, 2021, Saudi strategic objectives changed, and Emirati strategic objective changed, and so the good neighbor policy coming out of Tehran found receptive ears in regional capitals. And so now we have the look east policy and the good neighborly policy. You might remember that a couple of months ago, for the first time, Iran and Pakistan sent missiles to each other's territories. Iranians hit a, uh, what they call the terrorist base uh, inside Pakistan, and uh, two weeks later, Pakistan retaliated, and any other country that attacks the other one with cruise missiles, there would be major tensions within days. Iran and Pakistan patched up their differences. Uh, ambassadors went back and everything is back to normal. And just yesterday, they announced a major trade deal um, uh, with uh, one another. Uh, Iran and uh, Azerbaijan have tensions. Again, Iran has gone out of its way to reduce those tensions. Uh, of course, in March of 2023, uh, tensions with Saudi Arabia were resolved. Ambassadors were exchanged earlier in 2021. Uh, Iran-UAE relations improved. And so this good neighborly relations, ironically, has produced some results. And you might be wondering why, and my, maybe I'm just cynical, but my assumption is that Raisi does not have domestic legitimacy. You might remember about a year and a half ago, Iran was racked by major protests and people don't like him. He doesn't have electoral legitimacy. And so the one place where he can 
uh, have some legitimacy, the one thing that he can say, look, I've done something, is in the area of foreign policy. In terms of Luke East, which has had tangible results, Iran is now a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's a member of the BRICS. It's now, um, it's of course selling drones to Russia, uh, uh, apparently over the last um, uh, couple of weeks, there are reports that Iran has been sending precision missiles to Russia. Uh, so the Lukis policy is delivering, and, uh, and of course, um, the good neighborly relations are delivering. But there's also one other thing uh, that we cannot ignore in terms of the way Tehran sees the world around it and it sees itself surrounded. It sees itself surrounded by American footprints around the world. If you think of where American military presence is, if you get a map of the Middle East and put a star in every place where the United States has a military base, and you sit in Tehran and you look around you, you will see that you're actually surrounded. And there is some logic, there is some justification. This map is old because it has, uh, uh, it has American bases in Afghanistan. So for a minute, pretend those uh, stars in Afghanistan don't exist. But you know what? I'm not trying to make excuses for Iranian policymakers. They excel, the Iranian policymakers excel at shooting themselves in the foot. The Iranian state is Iran's worst enemy. But there is something to be said about their assumption of being surrounded by the American military. And here is, um, here, here is um, a visual, um, uh, visual impact of it. Now, what this tells me is that there's going to be continued tension in the Middle East. The Americans aren't going anywhere. Those stars aren't disappearing. And the Iranians aren't suddenly going to say, you know what, we're going to embrace the United States and American foreign policy. So from um, as a student of the region, I look at this and I say, there's going to be tensions in the foreseeable future. Uh, and it, unless there's a win-win scenario, uh, I o first heard the term win-win scenario in relation to the Persian Gulf in Tehran. I haven't heard it since. And the guy who told me um, has now uh, kind of gone um, over to the dark side. He's, he's no longer uh, in search of a win-win scenario uh, with the Americans. All right, by way of conclusion, what does this tell us? Everything that we have seen, the world from regional capitals, the world from Tehran, from Doha, Riyadh, uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, from Washington, what does this uh, tell us about where we are and uh, the region that uh, we've been talking about? Well. I mentioned, I started out by saying we're at the gates of historic change and we very, very well might be. Some of this is because of what I talked about. Some of this is because things happening outside of the Persian Gulf over which the Persian Gulf itself has no control. But we're seeing that the Houthis are of course, um, doing something about it. Interestingly, incidentally, you might remember that in October, the Houthis came out and criticized Iran. Why isn't Iran doing anything about the Palestinians? And the Houthis came out and said, if Iran doesn't do anything about the Palestinians, we're going to do it uh, ourselves. I am not familiar with the rhetoric and the narrative about the Gaza war outside of, uh, in, in Europe. I don't know how the French see it. In the Middle East, people see what's happening in uh, Gaza as ethnic cleansing and genocide. I know those are not comfortable terms, but that's the way 
people see it, and that's bound to have consequences for the way that things are going to occur. Now, of course, there's the war in Gaza that has unpredictable and unintended consequences, but also unpredictable is the very nature of the political systems that are there. Autocracies do whatever necessary to save themselves, even if they have to engage in the mother of all battles. You might remember Saddam Hussein's rallying cry, mother of all battles. So they would do anything to save themselves. Saudi Arabia, even Iran, um, uh, United Arab Emirates, if regime survival is in jeopardy, autocracies behave in quite unpredictable uh, manner. Now, unfortunately, we all die at some point, even if we are supreme leaders, even if we are supreme commanders. And the Iranian supreme leader, by the way, there's no such term in Iran as supreme leader. He is known simply as leader. Supreme leader is a term of journalistic convenience that Western journalists picked up because it looks ominous. And if you watched one of Steven Spielberg's latest um, Star Wars, there's an evil character called supreme leader. So it's convenient and we call him supreme leader. But anyway, even that guy dies whatever his title might be. He's 84, and Iran is bound to have a different, um, a different, not political system, but certainly a different leadership. And uh, in the Q&A, I might, uh, if, if you would like, uh, we could, be, could talk about that. And right now, if I were European, I would really prepare myself for a return of the Donald. Now, um, uh, it's, it's still early days. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen, but, uh, but the American president, the incumbent, is not helping himself. Uh, his election is in trouble. And uh, you might remember that two days ago in South Carolina, um, uh, Donald Trump beat his Republican opponent, Nikki Haley. She was the governor of South Carolina, and it, it, uh, he's on a, uh, despite everything, uh, it seems like he's unstoppable, Donald Trump. Now, we'll have to wait and see. Now, I, I say this because I, I do want to say something about American presidential elections. Historically, American presidents have engaged in what you might think of as heroic diplomacy in the second, uh, in, the, in, in the seventh year of their second year in office. Let me repeat that. Historically, American presidents have engaged in heroic diplomacy in the seventh year of their second term in office. When they win re-election, yes. seventh year, they do interesting things. Look at the two-term presidents. From Obama, who uh, are, uh, signed the Iran deal, to G.W. Bush, who became different, George W. Bush, who became a different person, traveled to Africa, to even uh, Ronald Reagan, who... Uh, Every one of these guys. Why? Because the first year is honeymoon. When they become first elected, first year the American president is in honeymoon. Mm -hmm. Second year, there's congressional elections. They don't want to be responsible. Third and fourth year, there's their own re-election. Then sixth year, if they get re-elected, sixth year, there's still congressional election. Then seventh year, they become concerned about their legacy they become concerned about the historic legacy. And they do things that they haven't done for six or seven years. If Biden gets re-elected, I am willing to bet, I'll buy everybody here dinner, <laughs> that if he gets re-elected, so it's a safe bet, if he gets re-elected, 
um, he's going to be a different, he's going to pursue a different foreign policy than he has done up until now. His foreign policy is likely to be uh, somewhat different. I don't know how, but he, it is going to be a different foreign policy in the same way that uh, Obama's was different, Clinton's was different, George W. Bush's was different, all of these people. So it would be interesting to see how the election uh, turns out. Having said all of this, we're likely to see some continuities uh, in one form or another. The American military um, presence will continue to be robust. Every year we see more and more American military sales in the region. Uh, military, military relations remain quite uh, robust, and because of America's continued military presence and continued military attention, we're still likely to see continued, um, uh, continued tensions. Of course, the Americans and the Iranians, I don't think we'll have the courage to come up with win-win scenarios. It's easy to continue to herald insults at each other. And of course, I think they're going to continue doing that while two peoples suffer. Uh, the Yemenis will continue to suffer and the Palestinians will continue to suffer. Of course, you hear the term, there's an African proverb that says, when elephants fight, the grass suffers. And unfortunately, the people of the Middle East and the Yemenis and the Palestinians in particular are likely to suffer. I hate to end the uh, talk on a, on a sad note, but unfortunately, we're likely to see continued tensions in the foreseeable future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Meran, for this lecture and these very clear and interesting words. We'll uh, remember the theory of seven years, uh, the seven year itch, so to speak, and uh, the difficulties that. Uh, when you reach a certain age, you can uh, fear that people, they, they will have a failing memory and they won't remember what they did before. So maybe they won't change that much. But anyway, in France, the General de Gaulle said, uh, towards the complicated uh, East, I went with simple ideas. And that was analyzed by diplomats, politicians, uh, academics, very often by giving a false interpretation of it, because when General de Gaulle wrote that in his memoir, of course, he thought of uh, the Syria campaign of 1941. It was very clear you needed to stop the Germans from turning Syria under French uh, protect, uh, that was a French protectorate under a, a base camp. And so he went with simple ideas there because he knew what the front lines were. And so it's true that here the questions that we're asking are how the two wars, especially about the Gaza war, but also the Ukraine war, vis-a-vis uh, -vis all these countries is leading to a reconfiguration, especially because we saw that there was a form of time of possible diplomacy in the region first around Israel with the Abraham Accords, the changes, and then what seemed to be a, P, a sign of appeasement, uh, the changes towards a good neighborly relations that you discussed with Iran in particular. So how all that realigned around the lines of antagonism of these countries, how these two countries, these two conflicts play a role, because of course they play a role. Iran provides the Russian war effort with considerable supplies, with weapons, namely. Iran, of course, be it in Syria or Lebanon or the Red Sea, uh, also playing a role as a major disruptor. So, of course, we can't really see how both conflicts wouldn't suddenly recreate fault lines between these countries. So that would be my first question. How do you think that the impact of these two conflicts is going to be transformational or apart from Iran that is very clearly positioned, all the other countries are rather mobile? 
Thank you for that question, uh, very good question. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things we see is that the Iranians, uh, the Saudis, the Emiratis, have learned to, or have been forced to compartmentalize uh, their, um, um, their foreign policy objectives and priorities. Um, certainly mistrust continues to be pervasive. They don't trust each other. And whenever possible, they try to undermine one another. But at the same time, they have realized that the costs of conflict outweigh the benefits of um, uh, detente or cooperation. Not, if not cooperation, but at least living uh, side by side. So you're absolutely right. I think actually, if I, if I may just, um, uh, this is likely to come up. In relation to the Gaza war, Iran has tried to engage in uh, what might be called a war of attrition. Mm -hmm. Relatively small scale um, conflict that over time, uh, increases the cost for Israel and the United States. And they try to do this, the Iranians have tried to do this by getting their um, proxies to attack Israeli and American targets and interests. So the Houthis are attacking shipping in the uh, Red Sea. Uh, the Iranian proxies, the Iraqi militia are attacking American targets in, um, in Iraq and we saw in Jordan uh, where uh, three Americans died. Hezbollah every once in a while in southern Lebanon releases a missile. This is what the Iranians want. Low scale, low intensity conflict with Israel and with the United States so that over time, the costs become prohibitive and the Israelis would uh, engage in ceasefire and the Americans leave. Now, this is playing with fire because this has the danger of escalation. This is, and this um, can antagonize the Saudis that have a very precarious ceasefire with the Houthis Already we heard the other day that Saudi Arabia and the UAE attacked some Houthi uh, missile sites uh, in Yemen. Uh, and so you're absolutely right. We're in a kind of a very tense moment, but at least they've decided to talk to one another. So this is much better than two years ago or a year and a half ago uh, the Iran-Saudi relations are in a better place as compared to two years or a year and a half ago when there was no lines of communication between them. At least now they have ambassadors. And every, literally every week, the Iranian foreign minister and the Saudi foreign minister talk to each other on the phone. And... Um, so there is diplomacy, and, and that's positive. They don't talk to each other through their proxies. They talk to each other directly. But the situation remains incredibly dangerous and incredibly tense. Uh, as we saw in relation to what happened in Jordan, uh, for the last uh, two years, even after Iran um, retaliated when General Soleimani was killed, Iran went out of its way to make sure that no American soldiers died. They gave the Americans 60 minutes, and they said, we're going to hit these two bases so that American soldiers could go and seek shelter. But you can't always control your proxies. If you're the one pulling the trigger, you can, uh, you can decide on the timing. But when the um, uh, Iranian proxies, the Iraqis, went and attacked uh, the base. They killed three Americans, and immediately the Iranian general in charge of uh, the Quds force traveled to Iraq and, to and spoke to the uh, militia and said, you guys have to stop. Uh, we, we don't want this, because the Iranians do certainly 
don't want a full-scale war with the Americans. So you're absolutely right. It's a very tense uh, situation. Uh, but um, the, um, the Iranians um, and the Saudis are at least talking. I should also mention uh, uh, the Ukraine war. I don't know why. I don't, I don't, I honestly don't understand why. But in the global south, the Ukraine war is not as much of a concern as it is in the West. And I don't know why, because we all know Putin is an unsavory character. But for whatever reason, um, you know, the, you don't hear the concern of, the, of Ukraine being occupied, being attacked in the global south, and, and in, including in the Middle East that you uh, hear um, elsewhere, particularly in Europe. And I, I just can't figure it out. I don't know why that is. You talked, you talked about Iran, the Iranian elections taking place two years after riots for freedom. And it's true that in reality, there's a form of definitive normalization that could happen of these rigged elections that will only bring to power a uh, uniform and conservative power leaders. So there's a question here because just as we might have thought that in Russia, society would ch change the leadership we could also think that society would change the leadership in Iran. Well, since 79, you know, it's been 45 years, nearly 45 years after the revolution. So we could have thought that uh, there would have been revolutions with deep impact breakthroughs and so on. But at some point, the river would go back, would flow back to its bed and uh, society would express itself through normalization. And so just as we might have thought after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain in Russia, but things seem to grind to a halt and society apart from, uh, and the modes of governance of these autocracies are not all the same because the people are not the same. The population is not as educated in another country, uh, as numerous, but it, that raises question about the organization of the future world and these various poles. So. You could use political means uh, to, to have confrontation, which is not desirable because it could degenerate into conflicts and the way Russia is now presenting its war of aggression on Ukraine. But you can see that if you try to go from the grassroots to society, the change is not happening the way we would have expected, not as spontaneously. So neither political sanctions or retaliation or pressure from democratic states on others, nor uh, the societal way works. I have been uh, studying Iran all my adult life, and I've been writing it, reading it, breathing it, sleeping it, and I still can't figure out that country. It's a mystery to me. <laughs> Let me say a couple of things about Iran. It's a really complicated, complex society. First of all, Iran seems to be going the way of your typical Middle Eastern dictatorship. It seems to be going the way of um, Egypt, for example. Uh, where the president keeps getting re-elected by 99.99% .99 of the votes cast. And votes don't mean anything. Um, but interestingly, as you mentioned, first of all, uh, you know, I, I, I realize I'm talking to a French audience, children of a historic revolution. I'm also a child of a revolution, the Iranian revolution. Revolutions are rare historic occurrences. Uh, it takes tremendous, um, uh, you know, stars have to be aligned for people to be mobilized, for the state to be weak and vulnerable, for elite to defect from institutions of power, 
for there to be a major rupture in society and the state and for revolution to succeed. And whereas we have had in Iran again and again <clears throat> protests and opposition, the state has not been weak and vulnerable. It hasn't been weak uh, and vulnerable to collapse. Uh, mass mobilization has not occurred at a national level. And so we haven't had the ingredients of a revolution in its true sense. This state, the Iranian state, is authoritarian, autocratic, and determined to stay in power. And for the foreseeable future, any changes that are likely to occur are likely to come from within the state rather than as a result of rather than from below, as a result of uh, people getting together and rising up and re overthrowing the state and reconstituting it. I also want to, I, I mentioned Iran is a complicated society, either because the state cannot necessarily control the people in their daily lives or because the state has decided to release some safety valve and enable people to express themselves in some ways. People have, because lives are not necessarily what you and I see on, on the news. Uh, today in Iran, women walk freely without the head cover in the streets, in the streets. I had a friend of mine on purpose um, go to the um, uh, anniversary of the revolution 20, um, on the uh, 1st of February uh, and 12th of February, major, go uncovered and nobody harassed her. She just tried to figure it out. Now, if you drive without your head cover, there are facial recognition uh, cameras that take a picture of your license plate and then you get an SMS in which you have to pay a fine. So women have now figured out when they drive, they put on the head cover because they don't want to get fined. But when they get out of their car, they remove their, their scarves. And so, so there is tremendous resilience, creativity, innovation, people, of ways of resistance, everyday forms of resistance that enable people to express themselves, express their individuality, express their opposition to the official ideology. And again, either it's because the state cannot enforce or doesn't want to enforce that degree of conformity so that society would explode in one way or another, you know, we we um, uh, you're absolutely right. You know, there's the there is tremendous pressure on the individual, but as people, as humans, we're also incredibly resilient and and creative. And uh, we see that, for example, among Iranian women. Incidentally, speaking of Iranian women, Iranian women did. Uh, what many, many men tried and, and uh, failed, which is kind of changed the status of women, uh, the social position of women. Um, they, brought, they shook this regime to its core in a way that for 40 years men tried and didn't succeed. And teenage women have succeeded by completely flaunting in university campuses, on the streets, in the major cities, taking their uh, scarves uh, off and, and kind of expressing opposition to the official ideology of the state. So now I'm going to give the floor to the room, starting from students and also questions from the web. Are there any hands shooting up? Yes. If you agree, first a series of three questions. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. I uh, actually have two questions. My first question would be, what do you think are the prospects of an implication of Arab states in, first of all, a potential durable settlement of the current conflict between Israel and Hamas, and in the longer term, 
possibly a new round of negotiations toward a potential uh, two-state solution. Uh, my second question, you touched on it uh, during your presentations uh, when you talked about the Houthis or the um, Ira Iranian militias in Iraq. How much control does Iran actually have on its proxies? Because it's sometimes seen as sort of a puppet master. But what is the reality? Thank you. Merci. Uh, Thanks. I'm looking at hands going up. Yes, sir. Mr. Alberic. I'll ask my question in French, if you don't mind. Well, with uh, the with peak oil that might have been reached in 2008, do you think that the declining hydrocarbon reserves in the region might lower the strategic importance of the region for Western countries that depend on them, but also for emerging countries like India, uh, where the economy uh, where is also well established, like in India, like in China? Sorry, do you think so? With the depletion of hydrocarbon resources, the region will lose some of its its importance, or will diversification strategies adopted by these uh, states, especially with Qatar and France, do you think that these strategies will be enough for the region to remain relevant on the global scale? Thanks. Another question? Please. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question about the role adopted by New Delhi, by India. Is it adopting a position similar to China's? So just be happy with uh, America guaranteeing security to do business, or is it trying to strike partnerships with some countries in the region in the Middle East? Thank you. Thank you so much. Maren, you have the floor. Thank you for those questions. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, the tragedy in Gaza is likely to continue as long as um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is in office. Uh, you know that uh, Netanyahu is in dire political straits domestically as far as Israeli politics is concerned. And in some ways, uh, he is prolonging the conflict uh, in order not to be answerable politically uh, to the Israeli electorate and uh, uh, and Israeli um, Israeli officials, um, so prospects for a durable settlement. Uh, and and then you asked about the two-state solution. Uh, uh, you know, one of my passions is writing. And uh, in 2016, I wrote a book, uh, which I don't like the title, whose title I don't like, and whose conclusions I like even less. The book is called The Impossibility of Palestine. And, um, uh, and for that book, I went to Israel and Palestine and did a lot of research. The two-state solution sounds nice. It sounds comforting. It sounds, it's, a, it's what all the diplomats talk about. Um, but when you go to Israel and Palestine, when you go to the, when you look at situation on the ground, you discover that the two-state solution is a mirage. Uh, it doesn't necessarily exist anymore. Palestine as an entity doesn't exist. Um, uh, Palestine has become a Swiss cheese state with major holes inside it. You can't go from one Palestinian city to another. It used to take 20 to 40 minutes. Now it takes hours because you have to pass through um, uh, checkpoints. Uh, and, and there's been major population transfers, uh, both Israelis coming to uh, Palestinian areas, Palestinians leaving Palestinian areas. So the two-state solution is kind of a nice catch-all phrase, and we've been talking about it since 1990s, but it doesn't necessarily, um, it no longer obtains. It's not, it's not 
realistic. Uh, and something that a Palestinian told me, Palestinian uh, civic activist told me, always stuck with me. He, in, uh, he said it in Ramallah. He said, look, I tell the Israelis, okay, you took my land, you took my home, you took my flag, you took my country, now give me health care, give me education. So I think the terms of the struggle have changed. The terms of uh, situation on the ground have changed. Uh, and the Iranians can talk about liberation of Palestine all they want. The Americans and world diplomats can talk about the two-state solution all they want. The Israelis and the Palestinians live a different reality. The reality is different. I don't know what that reality is. It's a one-state reality. I don't know what that reality looks like. I don't know moving forward what it's going to look like. But I think we need to change our frame of reference. We need to get realistic. And we can't kind of seek comfort in this familiar, uh, convenient two-state solution and think that it's still viable. Quite unfortunately, tragically, sadly, it's not. And I really do wish um, I, was, uh, I was wrong in, in that assessment, but that is my assessment. Uh, Iran's control of proxies, you're absolutely right. Uh, you remember that um, as soon as October 7th happened, people said, particularly Wall Street Journal, uh, and, and people in the West said, you know what, this was uh, technologically too complicated, too sophisticated. The, uh, the Hamas um, group couldn't have done it by itself. It must have had Iranian uh, support. Well, it didn't have Iranian support. Iranians didn't want Hamas to do what it did on October 7th. Um, Iranians didn't want uh, Hashd al-Shabi and other um, uh, uh, proxies in Iraq to attack the American targets the way it did. And almost immediately, everyone from the foreign minister to the president to the supreme leader of Iran all came out and said that uh, we didn't do it. We were not involved. And in fact, American intelligence um, uh, the CIA came out with an assessment that Tehran was surprised when October 7th happened. So these free agents are, um, uh, these uh, proxies are free agents. Oftentimes you cannot control them. And that's the problem with having proxies because um, uh, sometimes they become much more um, uh, independent than you would like. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the command commander of um, uh, God's forces, Qasem Soleimani's successor, flew to uh, 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 Baghdad and he met with leaders of eight um, proxies, eight of Iran's uh, uh, proxy, eight Shia militia groups. And he told them, we don't want you to attack American targets the way you have been. Seven of them said, okay, one of them said no. 48 hours later, that, that group said, okay, because then they said, okay, we're going to turn off funding for you. But, but even then, when um, General Ghani went to Baghdad, there was still one group that, uh, that said no. Um, declining hydrocarbons and declining strategic significance, particularly to India and China. You know, uh, for a number of decades now, we've been saying that the Middle East's oil is going to run out, um, and uh, that hasn't happened. But the Middle Easterners, uh, the Gulf, the oil producers themselves, have been trying to get ready for this. And one of the ways they've been trying to get ready for this is that they are, um, they've been engaging in major investments. Uh, I don't need to. Uh, tell a Parisian audience about Qatar's investments in, um, in, in France. A couple of years ago, some of my economist colleagues did a research and uh, they found out that if Qatar's investments abroad continue at the rate they have been, 
if Qatar runs out of oil and gas in 30 years, it could continue the same level of uh, rentierism. It could continue the same level of uh, transfer of wealth to the population, to Qatar's population, um, without oil. And the reason is this. Qataris are less than 200, uh, they're less than 300,000 people. Qatar has a population of 3 million. An overwhelming majority are like me, expatriates. And in my uh, residency, if I lose my job at Georgetown University, I have two weeks to leave the country. And so someone like me is on an incredibly short leash. I'm going to behave, I'm going to be very grateful. And imagine I happen to be fortunate to be a university professor. If I were a construction worker, if I were an Uber driver, if I were a domestic servant, I would be much more compliant. And so people like me that 2 million, 200,000 people like me, we don't say much. Now, again, I, I mean, I'm exaggerating. I'm under the umbrella of Georgetown University. I can say what I want. I can teach and write what I want. But imagine an overwhelming majority of people don't have that predicament. So those of us that these countries don't care about, and it's that 200, 80,000 people that is important to Qatari policymakers or Emirati policymakers or Kuwaiti policymakers. So long as those people are taken care of, then the, uh, uh, then the political system is on solid and safe grounds. Now, in terms of um, India and China, strategic significance of India and China, so far, you know, the Americans have been there, although they don't import from the region, their assumption, you know, American foreign policy uh, in relation to the Middle East has four main pillars, countering uh, threats to the United States, uh, however those threats might be, ensuring the safety and security of the state of Israel, access to uh, Middle Eastern natural resources to oil by America's allies and stationing troops in uh, the region, the ability to station troops in the region. These four pillars aren't likely to change anytime soon. And uh, I, I don't think in terms of, uh, and by the way, India is a close ally of the United States. Let's not forget in the region, one of the things we hear is double uh, uh, IW, double uh, IW. Israel, India, United States, United Arab Emirates. So these four countries are supposed to be strategic allies. And so that is, uh, that is of course, uh, important. Um, and yes, India, uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, is happy to be a free rider in uh, the Persian Gulf. You know, everybody wants to sell weapons. So it's not as if India or China don't necessarily want to sell weapons to uh, countries in the Persian Gulf. Uh, they, they all do. But first of all, there's a domestic preference for American hardware. Uh, the Gulfies themselves prefer American hardware and American uh, military hardware. And um, um, they're not India and China, at least in relation to the Middle East yet, are not in a position to export um, uh, weaponry. Alors, je vais prendre une deuxième... Right. We'll take another round of uh, questions. Maybe we'll start with the people online. And uh... uh, do you think a global balance can be found in and with the Persian Gulf? Uh, and would it be sustainable? Okay, should I answer each? No, we'll take three more. Mademoiselle? Please, please. 
Do you believe that a, a democratic revolution in Iran is possible? And if so, what would be the political force succeeding the Mullahs? Very good. And then this, who would succeed the Mullahs if there was? Thank you. And I have two questions, if I may. Uh, the first, you, you clearly show that in the region there are two pillars that are two dictatorships, Saudi Arabia on the one side and Iran on the other. One is the allied of the US, Saudi Arabia, and the other one is uh, getting closely al uh, aligned to Russia and China through the, the, the gas deals. Now, um, that of course um, uh, sheds a sort of a, a, a dark light on the America's advocacy for democracy in the world, but the rivalry between these two autocracies or these two dictatorships, if I may say so, the Saudis uh, were getting uh, closer to Israel through the Abraham Accords to counter Iran now that the uh, Accords are dead letter or just about. Are we to fear the return, if not war, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, but uh, uh, a, a confrontation between two very authoritarian regimes? Question number two. You never mentioned terrorism in the region. You did mention uh, Iranian proxies, but you did not um, consider the region as being a source of Islamic terrorism, uh, of which Europe has been a victim. Terrorism financed by a number of countries, including Qatar and Saudi Arabia, as regards um, the uh, the um, extremist uh, uh, imams and mullahs in in Europe. So, we'd like to know more about the financing of terrorism by these countries. All right, we'll take the next questions. Uh, let's uh, uh, answer the first three uh, questions now. Thank you very much. Again. Um, uh, these are all terrific questions, and I wish we had a uh, uh, we had a much longer time to discuss them. Uh, if I understood the first question that I think came from online, it was: uh, Would the Persian Gulf um, uh, present a challenge to the global balance of power? And I sincerely doubt it. Uh, uh, there is tremendous potential. In uh, the region, uh, there's tremendous wealth uh, in the region. Uh, if um, uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia put aside their differences, they can become major um, economic powers. There's, there's tremendous um, assets uh, there, but there's also tremendous animosity and mistrust. And I cannot imagine that either the Arab states of the Gulf or the Arabs and Iran uh, would um, uh, would um, uh, set aside their mistrust and their differences and uh, become a block so that they can become a global uh, global player. Um, I mentioned that the Gulf Cooperation Council has declined in significance, and that decline has been replaced by transactional relations between countries that kind of try and see where their immediate interests are, and uh, they pursue those. So I sincerely doubt, uh, doubt that. The other question was about, would, would there be a democratic revolution in Iran, and who would succeed uh, the mullahs if there were. Now, we know that at the broadest level, there are three types of revolutions. Whenever you have revolutions, there are three types. The first type are what you might call spontaneous revolutions, revolutions that don't start out as revolutions, but they snowball and they eventually become a revolution. The French Revolution, the Iranian Revolution, the um, uh, Arab Spring rebellions, they didn't start out as revolutions, but they eventually become one. And as the people get together, the state collapses and somebody emerges in their place. And usually the people who emerge in their place emerge, uh, they're like either uh, uh, Khomeini or Robespierre. They're not savory characters. They, 
they're there because they were able to eliminate all the opposition. And so spontaneous revolutions don't end in democracies, usually at least in the short term end in a reign of terror. A second revolution are revolutions of the kind we see in Cuba, in China. These are planned revolutions where a group of people get together and plan to take over the state. And they engage in armed struggle, they have an ideology, and they capture, if they capture political power, the revolution succeeds. And again, these kinds of revolutions don't end up in de democracies. In places like Cuba, in Vietnam, in China, uh, these uh, guerrilla revolutions or guerrilla movements that succeed. Then there are ca cases in which people get mobilized and they organize and the state gets weak but they reach a negative equilibrium where um, people can't overthrow the state and the state can't suppress the people. And this is exactly what happened in Eastern Europe in the late 1980s and in South Africa in the 1990s. So the East European revolutions and the South African revolution were negotiated revolutions. They were not spontaneous, they were not planned, but they were negotiated because the people who had to give up power, they negotiated the terms of their exit. Those revolutions end up in democracies because the way you negotiate is you have an election. Now, the, your question, the answer to your question is, is that is a negotiated revolution likely in Iran? Are we going to see a democratic revolution in Iran? I don't see uh, that negative equilibrium emerging in Iran, whereby the people become emboldened and empowered and the state becomes weakened in a in a process whereby they kind of have equal amount of power, where the only way out of this quagmire, out of this stalemate, is to say, okay, let the people decide and let the people decide on through elections. So would, would it, is a democratic revolution possible in Iran? I doubt it. I don't see the, uh, I don't see the, uh, ingredients, the necessary ingredients that at least historically we've seen elsewhere. Now, I want to also just remind us that the clergy in Iran are not a united group. Uh, the clergy are tremendously divided amongst themselves. And the biggest source of challenge to the clergy comes from within because these are people who know jurisprudence people who challenge interpretations uh, of particular doctrines religious doctrines using religious doctrine those are the biggest sources of threat so uh, we see for example that uh, Khamenei has done anything and everything he can to uh, marginalize two former presidents who were clerics President Khatami who was president from 1997 to 2005 and President Rouhani who was president from uh, 2013 to 2021 because those people pose the biggest threat from within the clerical establishment. And so, uh, you know, who would replace the mullahs? I don't know. I don't know if I, you know, and uh, you know, if I may just say one more thing. In Europe, we see a process whereby Christianity engages in the political process and, and becomes one of the primary engines of democracy. So we have Christian Democrats in Europe. In the Middle East, Islam has never had a historic opportunity to go through that process of political involvement. And so every time there's Islam involved in politics, it gets it, you know, it just hasn't had that ability to engage in a political process whereby it 
by default goes through an internal reformation where it has to realize that it needs to deal with other forces. It's not all or nothing. It has to engage in rules of the game. This is what was beginning to happen in Tunisia, where after the Arab Spring, where we had this Islamist political party called the Al Nahda take office. And you know what? They discredited themselves because they were really good at taking power. They were lousy at administering power. And so the Tunisian population's approach towards Islam and politics begins to change. They see Islam not as a, the source of salvation, but as another political force, like other political dynamics that are out there. And we haven't had that process occur in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in other places whereby Islam either discredits itself or goes through a process whereby it has to live with other political forces. And so that, I think, is, is something important to keep in mind. Uh, oh, dictatorship. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, dictate, uh, are we going to see a, di a confrontation between Iran and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia? You know, um, there was a likely possibility that Iran and Saudi Arabia would really uh, get into it. And um, I saw a cartoon that the Saudis had made about the Saudis liberating Iran from the mullahs and then uh, people in Iran waving Iranian flags and Saudi flags and holding up pictures of Mohammed bin Salman. It was a Saudi cartoon and it was kind of um, surreal and quite frightening when I saw this. And then what the Iranians did was they actually attacked Saudi oil facilities in uh, uh, 2019, if I'm not mistaken, in, the, uh, in Abqaiq. They attacked Aramco. They didn't claim responsibility. They said, we don't know who did it, but it was by all indications, the Iranians did it. And that was quite frightening also. I saw that and I was uh, quite frightened. So there was a time when the rhetoric and the possibility of a, an outward clash between these was quite, quite possible. And um, it was a very tense area. The Saudis backed off because the Americans didn't come to their rescue. When Iran attacked, the assumption attacked uh, Aramco oil facilities. The Saudi assumption was the Americans are going to, uh, to our rescue through the overarching American security umbrella. They didn't. Donald Trump simply condemned Iran and there was no military engagement. And so things, you know, they both calmed down, Iran and Saudi Arabia, and they've had to learn to live with one another. So I think the possibilities of a co confrontation, which is a no-win scenario, nobody's going to win, are very minimal. They're going to, they, they have had to learn to live with one another because the alternative is too, um, uh, just unfathomable, uh, difficult to imagine. In terms of terrorism and terrorism funding, um, I completely uh, agree that um, what we have seen in uh, coming from countries like Qatar and Saudi Arabia is the funding of mosques and uh, and um, uh, imams in mosques who are quite uh, radical. And um, what we haven't seen is the courage by Western leaders to call them on it. So we haven't seen somebody from in a position of political power in the West say, why are you doing this? Stop it. And that's because 
there are military sales, economic considerations, diplomatic considerations that they don't want jeopardized. Um, I think uh, Saudis have turned over a new page. My sense is that moving forward, the Saudis are going to do less and less of this because they are, um, it's not to their advantage. It is not the image they want to project. It is not something that they, uh, they're keen. And um, quite frankly, I honestly don't know. I just simply don't know if the Qataris do it. Uh, you know, if, if there is evidence out there, um, I, absolutely. But I just uh, don't know. But I, I think, you know, Saudi Arabia is in a, it would be really interesting to see if Mohammed bin Salman succeeds. If he succeeds, the relationship between state and religion in Saudi Arabia is going to be fundamentally different in the coming years. If he succeeds in his current project of social engineering, we were going to see a fundamentally different Saudi Arabia. And um, um, We'll have to wait and see. Um, I mean, I, I, um, I'm actually quite curious uh, to see where things go. Very good. And now we have, we have time for a final question, maybe. Um, uh, the uh, Altani, the Emir, will be in France, uh, and that was uh, that is a uh, warming up of uh, uh, French Qatar uh, relations uh, with this, the accusations in the background of uh, funding uh, radical organizations. Uh, so this uh, official visit will, uh, will be a, a way of uh, opening up or, uh, or, or giving, breathing new life into that relationship. Now, uh, sir, did you have a question or not? Oh, you, it was answered. Sorry. So, all right, all right. Two questions, but uh, uh, we we uh, we must not uh, take undue advantage of our uh, guests' patience. Uh, the the two final questions. Uh, who? Please go ahead. Well, many thanks for this lecture, and I do have a question. How do you see the efforts made by certain Arab countries? and Iran to destabilize Israel. And uh, why is Israel considered to be the aggressor state since the beginning of its history, since 1976, it's been defending itself against uh, the attacks of uh, Arab countries. You had the four uh, Arab-Israeli wars, and in particular, the 7th of October attacks, where the international community is referring to uh, a, a genocide, but had Hamas not attacked Israel, uh, this would the, the reprisals would not have occurred in Gaza. Well, yes, the, there's um, the hidden gods. You remember this uh, uh, conference where uh, uh, this figure was uh, uh, sort of looming in the background, and you you you, you asked a question. Now, Isabel Lasser, you have a question. Area is the day when. Um Iran becomes a nuclear country. What will happen in terms of, um, you know, a nuclear proliferation reaction of the states and new relationship between the states of the area? Merci beaucoup. Je vous laisse. Well, thank you, and so uh, and thank you for, for your kindness. We will we'll let you answer the two final questions then. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> the tragedy of Gaza did not start on October 6 or October 7 or October 8. Uh, the tragedy of Gaza, the tragedy of Palestine started much earlier. The tragedy of Israel started much earlier. This is a conflict that has been raging for 100 years, and we have seen ebbs and flows and we have become desensitized to the unraveling of human tragedies since um, uh, the creation of the State of Israel, before the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, and um, 
So um, why the, the question was, why are there efforts by Iran and uh, Arab countries to destabilize Israel? Um, that's a good question. I think equally valid question would be, why are there efforts by the State of Israel to destabilize Iran and Arab countries? And why are there uh, efforts by the State of Israel not to recognize the rights of Palestinians? And while what happened on October 7th was a crime against humanity, inexcusable, and those who perpetrated that crime against humanity on Israel on October 7, need to be accountable. The murder, the killing of 30,000 Palestinians after October 7 is also not defensible. And those who are doing those killings also need to be accountable. So um, I think uh, that's something to keep in mind. Finally, Iran as a nuclear as a potential nuclear power? Uh, there's a short answer and a longer answer. The short answer is if, if Iran becomes nuclear, Saudi Arabia has declared, they have actually, Mohammed bin Salman has said it in an interview, we're going to become nuclear. If Iran becomes nuclear, we're going to become nuclear. I don't think Iran is going to become nuclear uh, in the next few years. And why do I think that? Rightly or wrongly, the Iranians think they have the um, strategic advantage in conventional weapons. They could be wrong on this. But in Tehran, the assumption is that Iran has uh, the strategic advantage when it comes to missiles, when it comes to uh, drones, and that if it were to have a war with Saudi Arabia, with you know any of its adversaries, it could win. But if it goes nuclear, then it enters a race that it cannot win. That's the strategic thinking in Tehran. That so Iranian military commanders think uh, if they go nuclear, they have a lot of catching up to do with the Americans, with the Israelis, with the Indians, with the Pakistanis, who have had an early starter's advantage. So we might not want to enter that game because that changes the rules of the game. So from a strategic perspective, I don't think Iranian military commanders um, uh, uh, are after a nuclear bomb. What they are after is the ability uh, to build one. They know how to put one together in relatively short order, six months probably. And so it's called uh, threshold capacity. They want to reach, they want to, know, do, to have the know-how, to have the facilities, to have the basis, but an actual nuclear bomb, I don't think they want not because they're nice people or whatever, but because I think they think it's not to their strategic advantage. Um, uh, uh, if I may just add, uh, add to that. Um, interestingly, for the last year, we hear much more talk about Iran going nuclear from Iranian politicians not from the outside, but the narrative in Iran has changed about Iran going nuclear because they see that as the only leverage against the Americans and the West. They, they don't think they have any other leverage. And so if there's the constant threat and uh, higher levels of enrichment, then they, they assume that they can use that as a uh, leverage, but I think if they go nuclear, they'll lose that leverage. Merci, Mehran. Uh, merci beaucoup. Well, thank you, Mehran. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merci. Et, et merci. 
and uh, many thanks for providing the segue to uh, uh, Masa Akiyama's lecture, which will be dealing with another part of the world, Southeast Asia. And uh, there you have Iran that wishes to remain below the threshold, but North Korea going beyond and therefore upsetting the balance of power in that part of the world.